Welcome everyone. Good to see you here again tonight. Our topic is called, Is Genesis 1 Trustworthy? Because we have to be honest, if the first chapter of the book of Genesis or the first chapter of the Bible can be proven to be false, then why should anybody have any confidence in the rest of the Bible? After all, the claim is by the Apostle Paul, that all Scripture is inspired by God. But I want to assure you that when we study the subject of Genesis chapter 1, it stands the most closest cross-examination by the enemies of the Bible that you could possibly imagine. In fact, this is what we're going to be looking at today. Is Genesis, or this evening, is Genesis 1 trustworthy? Now, you may not know it, but the theory of evolution did not begin with Charles Darwin and in fact in, in fact his grandfather was actually an evolutionist uh, in the late 1700s in the 1800s he was an evolutionist but even before then we have a man by the name of Jean Baptiste Lamarck and he actually produced a book called Zoologica Philosopher in 1801 uh, where he espouses the view that the scientific explanation for origins of life in this world was evolution but did you know what we can go back even further than Jean Baptiste Lamarck. We can go back further prior to the time of Christ if we're trying to find the origins for evolution. Because if we were to go back to the Greeks, we would actually find that the Greeks were the first one who espoused the view of evolution. They taught that animals evolved from plant life and they also taught that mankind evolved from fish and you have leading scientists of the day and I'm talking about around 600 BC men such as Anaximander, Empedocles and Aristotle and all of these men shared the view that evolution was a reasonable explanation for life on this world as we know it. However they were not in the majority and the reason why was there was another theory that was more compelling in the minds of the leading scientists prior to the time of Christ and after the time of Christ in the pagan world. And that was a theory known as spontaneous generation. This theory taught that worms and insects suddenly appeared. They suddenly spontaneously appeared on the earth and they came forth from mud and they come from slime. And they argued that if this was the case for insect life, then why not for the larger animal forms? Why not for mammals? Why not for mankind? However, spontaneous generation was scientifically disproved as early as the 1500s. You have men such as Louis Pasteur, Francisco Reddy and the like, other in, in, eminent scientists who by way of very simple experiments they actually proved that spontaneous generation was false. For example it was Francisco Reddy who actually did the experiment using raw meat and he put one in an open cylinder and he put another one in a sealed cylinder and uh, the simple experiment demonstrated that the flies could not attack or attach themselves to the raw meat therefore they could not lay eggs therefore the maggots could not be formed. So in this simple experiment it seemed to disprove the prevailing theory of the die of spontaneous generation and uh, but despite that we see that spontaneous generation was maintained and was held on to by many eminent scientists despite the fact that men like Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur and others had disproved it by experimentation and by observation which after all is a hallmark of all true science but nevertheless even when we get into the early 1900s there are still scientists eminent scientists who resists the move to adopt evolution and one such man was a man by the name of Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel he made a statement and he said this spontaneous generation must be true otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. It's a very interesting statement. Haeckel was right and honest because he recognised that even though he lived in the 19th century and evolution was the predominant theory of the day then, as it pretty well is, pretty much is today, he recognised that there are intrinsic problems with evolution. See, Ernst Haeckel understood that uh, it would be impossible 
for evolution to be correct be based on the simple cell or the simple single cell hypothesis leading to more complex type cells. Because even Ernst Haeckel back then recognised that all the information had to be in the cell in the beginning in order for it to develop. You couldn't get simple to complex uh, with sudden random uh, appearances of extra information in the cell structure. He knew that and many other scientists knew that uh, in the day. They declared what microbiology, pharmacogenomics and genetics and the like proves to us today that you, ca you have to have all the information in the DNA for the um, uh, information to be transferred to the following generation and it's just as simple as that. It was for this reason that um, century after century saw the uh, prevalence of uh, spontaneous generation just dominate the scene. But as I said, by the time we get to the early 1800s, we have men like Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, uh, his zoological philosopher, came out. And then we have The Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin in 1859. An, emphasis, an evolution by its emphasis on a natural selection and random processing has encouraged the view of a world without God. Now, probably the most infamous, if you like, the most famous for others, uh, leading proponent of the evolutionary cause is this man here. Richard Dawkins is a professor emeritus at uh, Oxford University. He's had a long and distinguished career. But in defence of evolution and its effect on society, this is what Richard Dawkins has said. What I care about is what is truth. Now, when he refers to truth here, he's talking about truth as proven in or as um, the scientific community would talk about evolution. That's what he's referring to here. What I care about is what is truth. What is true about the universe? If it was true that evolution had adverse effects on religion and caused people to smash windows and rob old ladies, which it doesn't, by the way, but even if it did, that still wouldn't in any way affect its truth value. We've got to take the truth uh, about the universe and the truth about the world separate from the moral and political consequences, whatever that may be. So Dawkins says here that we have to separate the truth. He's referring to evolution here. And he says we have to separate it from the moral and political consequences, whatever that may be. Now, he talks about evolution as a truth. The first point that I want to make with you, uh, it's only a theory. Remember, evolution is just a theory. Why is it still a theory? It's because it's never been tr proven by observation or experiment. It's never been proven that way. So it's still only a theory. It's still only an idea. And even though Dawkins authoritatively supports evolution, the reality is that today this theory as presented by Charles Darwin over 150 years ago and supported by a shrinking number of scientists, it's looking more like a patchwork quilt with huge holes in it than a tenable theory that thinking men and women can base proper research on. That's the reality. It's not standing up to the rigour of the modern scientific world with the advances in pharmacogenomics, genetic engineering and these sort of things. Evolution is just not ticking the boxes anymore the way it used to. Now what I want to do is I want you to understand the difference, the basic difference between evolution, the evolutionary thought and also what the Bible says in creation, the, the biblical view of the creative act by God. Every thoughtful person wants to know about the origin of life. Where did we come from? Where did the animal life come from? Where did bird life come from? Where did the world itself come from? And the Bible tells us that the world was created, the physical world and the natural world was created in six literal days, six 24-hour days by a loving and benevolent creator God. Man and woman, God created on day six of the creation week and the Bible says that after he created all things, everything was good. On the other hand, evolution, 
with its emphasis on random mutation and uh, selection. It actually teaches the world began and everything that we experience in the physical and natural world actually began by what is named as the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. And it came from a highly condensed mass about the size of a golf ball. Uh, this is what evolutionists teach. And that highly condensed mass, the size of a golf ball, it exploded 13.7 billion years ago. And everything we see, everything we experience is a re result of that massive explosion which happened 13.7 billion years ago. Now, in order to explain this golf ball size mass, evolutionists have gone to other theories. Again, it's a theory not proved by uh, observation or experiment, but they've gone to other theories such as string theory or parallel universes to explain the origins of life. But again, it doesn't bear the test of reasonable science at all. Nevertheless, let, us bring you, let me bring you back to this mortal coil because evolutionists teach that a simple single cell was generated about 500 million years ago on this earth. In fact, it goes back a little earlier than that, billions of years ago. And from that simple single cell, life generated. And then we have those simple seabed dwelling creatures. And then about this happened about 500 million years ago. And then uh, we see that the sea life evolved into land animals. And then 50 million years ago, it talks about mastodons and mammals and the like coming on the world. And then 2 million years ago, it talks about the hominids, our ancestors coming onto planet Earth. And we've been evolving ever since, but no one's been able to prove it by experimentation or by observation. One of the outstanding facts that nobody can deny, and that is the further science advances, the closer it comes to the Genesis account of in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It all began at the one place, the one time. Whether it's the areas of microbiology, pharmacogenomics, genetics, the closer it moves to the teachings regarding the origins of all things. And what I mean by that is science today is clearly showing that there needs to be all the information in the earlier cells in the genetic code for that same information to be produced at a later date. In other words, simple to complex is untenable today in the scientific world. All the information had to be there in the Bible. And in fact, the book of Genesis tells us that's exactly how it was. And the Bible tells us also that when God created life on this earth, that is the plant life, the fish life, the mammals, the bird life, everything in this world, God had placed all the information within each of those different types, in, the, in each of those different kinds, in order for that type to be able to flourish and to multiply. In Genesis chapter 1, we read this. In the beginning, God created the what? the heavens and the earth. And we go to verse 27 in the same chapter. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So God, the great designer and life great giver, created everything that we see, everything that we experience. It was fully developed and functional at the time in which God created it. In fact, the Bible uses the word good over and over again to describe how things were after day one, after day two, after day three, after day four, five, six, etc. It tells us that it was good. There was no need for God to come back later and make some modifications, to make some improvements on the species, to make improvements on the kind of animals. Uh, and this is in sharp contrast, of course, with, uh, with what evolution uh, presents. Because evolution pre presents um, that there were lots of mistakes. There need to be many changes. There need to be many uh, improvements in the evolutionary process. So this is in co sharp contrast to what the Bible says. For example, 
in relation to this evolutionary thought that there were constant mistakes, there were constant mutations which had to be corrected with succeeding generations, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in his book Philosophica, a Zoologica Philosopher, which was released in 1801, he uses an example here where there are mistakes in the original and they'd have to be improved with succeeding generations. For example, he talks about giraffes. He says, originally, giraffes all had short legs and they all had short necks. But the reality is that when you go back over the fossil record, there's no evidence of short-necked, short-legged giraffes anywhere. They just can't be found. There's always been long-necked and long-necked giraffes. And this powerfully supports the opening chapters we see in Genesis chapter 1. For example, gi giraffes have always needed uh, extra large hearts. This wasn't something that was added uh, because of mistakes made in the early prototypes, in the early models. Giraffes from the beginning have always needed extra large hearts to pump the blood up to the brain in order for it to survive. But when a giraffe puts its head down to drink water or to eat from the ground, there are a number of things that happen within the anatomy of the giraffe that pre prevent it from dying immediately because if those things didn't happen the giraffe would die because of the force of blood going to the brain it would kill it instantly so when a giraffe opens its legs there are a few things that happen first of all the heart rate slows down that's the first thing that happens second thing that happens that within the veins of the neck of the giraffe there are valves which all close over as we get closer to the brain which stems the flow of blood and then at the base of the brain there is a spongy mass which reduces the impact of the blood as it reaches the brain when the the giraffe is in that position uh, bending down drinking water or eating food from the glass now you can imagine if any part of the giraffe's physical equipment wasn't fully functional or developed in the beginning, it would never have survived. In order for a giraffe to have survived the way it has, it needed all of its working parts fully functional and fully developed. But let's play a game now. Let's you and I just pretend that evolution is correct. Now, I know that many of you here are still in the valley of decision when it comes to this, but let's just play a game. Let's pretend that evolution is correct. But just for a thought experiment, let me ask you something. At what point of the evolutionary mechanical scale did the giraffe not have the, the, the large heart that needs to get the blood to the top of the brain? Or what part of the evolutionary process for the giraffe did it not have the valves in its neck? Or did the heart not uh, reduce in power or strength when the legs were open? And what part did that happen? You see, the questions that are, are endless. For the giraffe to, supply, to survive, it needed all, of its, all its parts fully functioning and developed all at once. And that's not evolution. That's creation. That's in the beginning God. See, way back in the beginning when God created the giraffe, they created them with all their working parts fully functional and de developed. All right, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 we read this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Genesis 1 verse 27. Here we read that man was created in God's image, not only emotionally, not only physically, but God also gave us other abilities as well so that we could enjoy life to the full. For example, he gave us our five senses. We have hearing, touch, taste, uh, sight and smell, those five senses. And we are incredibly made, wonderfully made. In order for these things to function, God gave mankind a brain. And there is nothing more complex in the, in the earth more than the human brain. The brain has about 10,000 million nerve cells. Each nerve cell produces about 10 to 100,000 connecting fibers, which make contact with other nerve cells in the brain. The total number of connections in the human brain is 10 to the power of 15. That is one quadrillion now. That's a lot of connections. But for us to understand the magnitude of this 
this uh, and the complexity of the brain. I want to illustrate it this way. Imagine that we have a vast forest and this forest extends from Melbourne all the way up to Newcastle in New South Wales. It's set out in a perfect square. It goes from the coast of Victoria all the way across to um, uh, uh, Adelaide in South Australia. So you have this vast forest set out in a perfect square. Now imagine that you have 85,000 trees on every square kilometre of that vast forest. So 85,000 trees on every square kilometre of that vast forest. And within every tree or upon every tree, you have 100,000 leaves. The total number of leaves in that forest would be one quadrillion or 10 to the power of 15. It's simply inconceivable to believe that the human brain with its incredible complexity could have, which is responsible for our taste, our sight, our feelings, for our motor movements, all these things could have happened by a random explosion as evolution teaches. It's just an absolute impossibility. What we understand about an explosion, that it never brings order, it only ever brings chaos and that's the result. Imagine this, let's play another game now. Let's pretend that we go to a scrap metal yard and in the scrap metal yard we've got wire, we've got glass, we've got all sorts of metals and rubbers and what have you and then what we do is we actually plant dynamite at the heart of that scrap metal yard and then we push the plunger down and all of a sudden there's a massive explosion and from the dust and debris we see this beautiful brand spanking new 747B jumbo jet coming out. Now, what do you think the chances are of that happening would be? What would the chances be? Absolutely zero, right? But I want to tell you something, that the human eye is infinitely more complex than a, a jumbo jet, infinitely more complex than the latest jet fighters that are still on the um, uh, drawing board for the Americans and the Russians, infinitely more complex with its connections to the brain. Yet evolutionists want you to believe that our human eye, with all of its wonderful parts and pieces, and with the millions of millions connection to the human brain, that originated from a random explosion 13.7 billion years ago. Doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Now, I don't have time today or this evening to talk to you about the wonderful relationship the human brain has with the human eye, but I'm going to do it by way of demonstration. Uh, the sport I'm going to share with you now is actually called Australian Rules Football. It's by far the most popular sport here in Australia, certainly here in Melbourne, uh, and I've heard a few amens uh, out here. Of course it is, and it's a spectacular, it's a fast move moving sport. Now in AFL football, in Australian rules football, you have what's known as the high flying mark or a catch. Uh, the word mark, which is used when a player catches the ball after it's been kicked to him, the word catch actually comes from the uh, word mark rather, it actually comes from the indigenous Aboriginal word mark. That's why in uh, Aussie rules football they use the word mark to describe a catch. But I want to show you something here um, uh, by way of illustrating how incredibly we are made. Uh, and you're going to see an Australian rules footballer playing for the team Collingwood take a spectacular mark. Fourth quarter, Jacobs, Thomas done some damage, has Dale Thomas, Cracker! Oh boy, unbelievable jack in the box. What a magnificent, unbelievable indigenous round. We saw John got there, he's in shock. Now I want you to consider what that uh, player, Andrew Cracker, actually did uh, in that uh, when he took the mark. This is what actually happened there. Um, he sensed the energy of the kick and triangul triangulated the position of the object in its flight with his binocular vision. Secondly, with his in this information calculated in his brain, he edited out any distractions. Third, he bought an extraordinary single mechanism into precise operation, that being his hands. 
One set of muscles after another set of muscles throughout the body was engaged, as well as the countless million nerve receptors completed the task from the message given from his brain. And all that happened in the less than one second. Unbelievable jack-in-the-box. What a magnificent, unbelievable Indigenous round. We saw John got there. Think about this. The miraculous mark that we just saw there that's just one of a myriad of things that men and women can do on planet earth isn't that right the bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made the reality is that that demonstration highlights that we are created in the image of god and in fact the information which allowed him to take that mark is all tightly packed in a single tiny gene, in a single chromosome, in a solution so concentrated that a teaspoon of that solution, there will be enough information in the teaspoon to be able to build and engineer all the seven billion people who are upon planet Earth today. That's how wonderfully and fearfully we are made. We are a brilliantly engineered piece of equipment from the hand of the Creator God. We're made from a loving and benevolent God who gave us wonderful abilities, gave us wonderful gifts in order that we can do extraordinary things here on this earth. We didn't swing down out of the trees. We didn't crawl out of a mud, a mud puddle as physicists want to teach, as evolutionists want to preach to us. No, in do you not we're made in the image of God and in the image of God we are made did you know that in the evolutionary circles in the inner conclaves there's a, a war going on it's been going on for quite a long time now this war because they are recognizing that their pet theory is not standing up to the advances in modern theory there are holes that are appearing gaping holes uh, in time magazine there was a, a whole feature entitled evolution wars and because of this battle that's uh, raging between the theory of evolution and uh, the editorial piece actually said this scientific evidence supports a biological in innovation that occurred virtually at the same time in the geological geologic time around the world now wait we could read that and say, wow, that's impressive. But think about what it says. It says scientific evidence supports a, a, a biological innovation, that's life, occurred at virtually the same instant in geologic time. So the same time that the earth was created, there we have life happening at, at pretty much the same time. It sounds like Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it? Where it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says on day one, God created the, uh, the light, day two, the ferment, day three, the earth, uh, day four, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the stars and the sun, the moon, day five, the plant life, the birds, the animal life in day six, mankind day six, all happening at the same time there. And it's no wonder that there's confusion in the uh, scientific world or particularly in evolutionary cycles because what they're trying to say is that this world began with a random explosion around 13.7 billion years ago and then millions and millions and millions of years later simple si single cell organism uh, suddenly came to life. But where does life come if it doesn't come from another life source? They say that inanimate brings animate. They say that non-life brings life but that's we're going to talk about that in a moment let's continue on now there was an article by a man uh, in this same uh, in this same issue of time magazine his name was hs limpson uh, he was a professor at uh, manchester university in the uk and he says this i think however that we must go further than this and admit that the only acceptable explanation is what? What does he say here? He says is creation. I know that this is an anathema to physicists as indeed it is to me. In other words, do physicists, does he like this idea of creation? No, it doesn't because it means he has to recognise that there's a higher power, that God is the creator. But notice what else he says. We must not reject the theory that we do not like if the experimental evidence supports it. 
He is saying now that the experimental evidence is supporting the creation account in the Bible. Uh, this man here, his name is Stephen J. Gould. He was a professor of geology and paleontology at Harvard University. He uh, was a very important person in uh, the scientific world and uh, presenting views of evolution. But this is what he says. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil records persists as the trade secret of paleontology. What did he say? He says the extreme rarity of transitional f um, forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary tree that adorns our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. So, Stephen Jay Gould is saying here that that uh, evolution's claim that we evolved, they're saying, we're looking at the end results around the world today with modern men and women, with plant life, with animal life, but it's saying all the other transitional forms which preceded this as presented by evolution, he is actually saying there that, it, that the rest of that is inference. In other words, it is inferred. It's not observed by experiment. It's not observed by evidence. There's nothing in the fossil record to prove it. And this man was the leader in the evolutionary movement in the, seven, in the 60s and the 70s, Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, this man, Francis Crick, he was the Nobel Prize winner for DNA discovery in 1953 with another man by the name of Watson. He continually reminded his students that when you're going into study DNA and the incredible structure within the DNA um, uh, molecule, he, he, he would remind his students that you are not looking at anything designed. It's happened by chance. And he would repeat this over and over again. It's not designed. It's there by chance. But he said this, the origin of life appears to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have to be satisfied to get it going. What does he talk about life? He says, it's a miracle. And he says, so many are the conditions which would have had to be satisfied to get it going. Because Francis Crick recognises that you need to have the environment, the hospitable environment, to support life, to support terrestrial life. You also need those different species, the different kinds, the plant life, the flora and fauna, uh, to be able to have all their equipment fully developed and functional in order for them to survive as well. And as well as the symbiosis we've seen between animal life and plant life, etc., for those different types to survive. He's recognizing that, but he's veiling it. He's not coming out, outward and saying we believe in God or God's, ha God has to be a part of this, but he says it's a miracle. It's a miracle. This person here is uh, Dr. David Raup. Dr. David Raup, he was a curator of geology in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago. We quote him uh, when he said, we now have a quarter of a million fossil species, but the situation hasn't changed much. Ironically, we have even few examples of evolutionary change. How can that be? How can it be after all this time, after all these years, over 150 years using the latest scientific equipment, they have even fewer examples of evolutionary change transitions than we had in Darwin's time. By this I mean that some of the classic cases of Darwinian change in the fossil records such as the evolution of the horse in North America have had to be discarded. These are powerful statements by some of the strongest proponents of evolutionary thought and over the last 50 years but their testimony is damning. They're saying that modern science is not leaning towards the support of evolution. In fact, it's actually leaning the other way. It's highlighting the fact there must have been a designer. It all began at the one time, and that sounds like a lot like Genesis chapter 1 to me. Let me give you another example. This is from the insect world about the way that, just as we observe the common things in life, that they actually support very strongly the Genesis account found in the Bible. 
For example, the honeybee is a miraculously engineered flying machine. Its short, stubby wings allow it to fly in and out of a, of a flower with great ease. Now, the bee, the honeybee, needs two things. It needs pollen to survive and it needs nectar in, uh, to survive. Now, a bee can suck up a load of nectar in about one minute because it has a nectar tank inside its body. It can actually build up uh, two bulging loads of, of pollen on its baskets on its hind legs in around about three minutes. Now, how does the bee do it? Well, the bee will dive into the flower and brush its body past the pollen boxes. It has hairs on its body. The, uh, the pollen is attached, uh, sticks to the hairs on the bee's body. Then the, bi the bee removes the, the pollen from the hairs, tamps it into the baskets on it hi its hind leg. It moistens it so it doesn't fly, fly away in flight or blow away in flight. And it does it all the while, while hanging on with one leg or hovering in mid air. However, the honeybee, with all of its fascinating and marvellous equipment for the job, did it happen by chance? Did it just happen a little bit at a time incrementally with all of its marvellous engineer and with all of its mar marvellous parts? What if the bee, what if the bee, when it first started, had no pollen basket? What if it had no pollen baskets? What if the bee, let's just play a bit of a game. What if the bee had no, didn't have the hairs on its body? How could it gather the pollen in? What happens if it had the hairs on the body, but it had no way of actually removing the pollen from the body and putting it, or from the hairs and putting it into the baskets? What about if it had the hairs on its body and it was able to collect the pollen, but it didn't have the knee joints in its legs to be able to tamp the pollen into the the, the, the pollen baskets. You see, the questions are endless. A bee needed all of its equipment fully functional and developed all at once so that it would survive. And that's not evolution. That's not part by part. That's in the beginning God. Now, furthermore, if evolution is correct, and we, we now are starting to believe, and I know some people here will be thinking, okay, perhaps I've got to rethink this. But if evolution is correct, think about this. What was the first honeybee? Because remember, evolutionists say that uh, life generated and came and evolved over millions and millions of years. So what was the first bee? Probably another question would be, what was the first man that came, evolved from the ape? Was it a male or was it a female? Did it happen at precisely the same time in Africa and in Asia? And the question that I want to ask, if it did, how did that male or how did that female actually come together to be able to reproduce? But that's another quandary that evolution fails to grapple with in a, a proper and a coherent way. But that first bee on the, on the tree millions and millions of years ago, what sort of a bee was it? Was it a queen bee? Well, it couldn't be a queen bee because a queen can't reproduce itself. Was it a drone? No, nah, couldn't have been a drone because a drone bee can't reproduce itself without the queen. Well, we say it must be the miracle worker of the hive, the worker bee. It couldn't be a worker bee because they can't reproduce at all. See, the only conclusion that we can't, can come to is that the bee, with all of its wonderful equipment, had to be fully developed and functional all at once in the beginning. But not only one bee, the whole colony had to be there uh, in the beginning once. You needed the queen, you needed the drone, and you needed the worker, or the beehive, wouldn't, or the bees would never have survived. Does that make sense? And this is what the book of Genesis says. He says that on day six, God created the insect life, and he saw that it was all good, because he created complete communities of insect life so that they could flourish and multiply in this world. And that's creation. That's in the beginning God. Actually, you know what? I, I do feel a little bit tired today, a bit worn out actually, because I tell you why. It's all due to this watch here. You see, um, last night at about 2 a.m., I heard all this rattling and scratching on my bedside table and I turned on the bedside lamp and I saw that my watch was in absolute pieces 
And when I turned on the light, all of a sudden there was a scurry on top of the dresser and I saw screws and I saw springs and I saw cogs all doing this merry dance and then suddenly they started to put themselves back into each other and connect and then I saw the hands go onto the face and then uh, the face was placed on and it all happened before my eyes and probably within 10 or 15 minutes the watch was back to its original condition and then I stopped I was aghast at what I saw I thought I was dreaming but I wasn't dreaming and then I heard this tick 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 it was just a miracle now do you believe that story you believe that story of course you don't believe that story but the reality is that the human eye is infinitely more uh, complex than this basic old watch here but evolutionists teach that incrementally over millions and millions of years the human eye put it uh, put it together and they don't even raise an eyebrow but here i am telling you about this watch and you say oh come on we couldn't possibly believe that how much more should we not believe that the human eye evolved over billions of years but it started with a huge explosion 13.7 billion years ago as i said um to have anything well engineered, you need a designer. We see it in our world today. And the designer of us and the designer of this world was God himself. Many years ago, I read a book called The Twilight of Evolution. It was written by a man called Henry Morris. Uh, it was written in 1963. But even back in 1963, evolution was in real trouble in light of advancing evidence in modern science. And what he identified there is what evolutionists see very clearly now, is that the missing links are still missing. They were in 1963, but it's all the more the case today. For example, as he went over the progression of mankind, the evolution of mankind, he actually discovered that there was actually dishonesty clearly presented in, uh, in the case for some of these evolutionary uh, links, these supposed missing links. For example, when it came to uh, Heidelberg man, he discovered that this was built from the jawbone, which was conceded by many to be human. When it came to the Nebraska man, it was scientifically built from one tooth and that was later found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. The Piltdown man, the jawbone turned out to belong to an ape, with the teeth fold down after the hoax was discovered. And then Peking man, all evidence has disappeared. And then you have uh, Cro-Magnon man, one of the best established fossils, equal in physique and brain capacity of modern man, so there is really no difference. And then you have Orchi man or Orc man, found in the southern Spanish town of Orque in 1982. And how does the oldest fossilized human remains ever found in Europe? One year later, officials admitted the skull fragment was not human, but probably came from a four-month-old donkey. And let's not forget about the uh, very famous Neanderthal man was first discovered in the Neander Valley in, near Dusseldorf in Germany uh, in the 1800s. He was classified as semi-subhuman and this was based on the evidence they said, science said at the time, that it showed that he was once crippled, he was crippled but once worked, walked upright. But in the light of modern science, it's actually shown that this was just an old man with rickets who actually had a larger cranium than us and it was proved a hoax nothing to do with the missing link whatsoever it was just an old man with rickets you know it was assumed over the last 150 years that the missing links would eventually be found that with the advances in scientific research, with the, adv the advance of um, uh, satellite imaging, with the advances in exploration, etc., that the missing links would certainly be found. But what's been f uh, discovered is that the li links are still missing today. In fact, we read by Dr. Raup that many of the links, supposed links, have actually been discarded now because they don't meet the criteria. They don't line up with... Uh, scientific research 
In 1982, just after, well, 20 years after at least, the uh, book by uh, Dr. Morris, The Twilight of Evolution, a doctor by the name of uh, David Kitts, Pro Professor David Kitts, wrote in a, an article in a magazine called, or a journal called Evolution, and he says this. He said, Despite the bright promise that paleontology provides means of seeing evolution and has provided some nasty difficulties for evolutionists, the most notorious which is the presence of gaps in the fossil record. Evolution requires intermediate forms between the species and paleontology does not provide them. Did you understand what it says there? Paleontologists were believed that they would bring light, that they'd bring forth the gaps, but it hasn't done that. In fact, the gaps are there. The fossils are still missing today. It's a sad reality. Well, it's not a sad reality, but it's the reality when something is built on, ever, on error. Even Charles Darwin, the, um, the founder, if you like, of modern, the modern evolutionary movement, he actually says this in a book called My Life and Letters. He says, not one change of species into another is on record. We cannot prove that a single species has been changed. And even in his book on um, evolution, and in that same book, you can get it now, you can buy it now, he says, to suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the what? in the highest degree. What is he saying here? He's saying it's an impossibility. It could not happen at all. That is a telling remark from the founder of the modern evolutionary movement. There was a book written a number of years ago called The Quantum Enigma by Wolfgang Smith. And in that book, he says this, a growing number of respectable scientists are defecting from the evolutionist camp Moreover, for the most parts, these experts have abandoned Darwinism, not on the basis of religious faith or biblical persuasions, but on scientific grounds and in some instances, instances regretfully. Wow, what a comment. It's saying the scientific evidence does not support evolution. It does not support Darwinism. And these people are leaving the evolutionary camp, not because they want to, but regretfully. They're not leaving it because they've studied the Bible and they've been converted to Christianity. Not at all. They've looked at the evidence and the evidence just does not stack up. It stacks up in favour of a designer. In, it stacks up in favour of intelligent design, which is just code for God in scientific world. That's all it is. But it doesn't line up with the evolutionary premise, the evolutionary theory at all. You see on the screen there a wooden chair. One of the things that evolution cannot answer is where does life, how does non-life generate life? How does that happen? Well, it can't happen. We know that it can't happen. Science has shown us now that it cannot happen. But evolution taught there was an explosion. Uh, inanimate matter became animate matter. No life became no life. But here's a question to you. If I plant a wooden chair into the garden, it's made of wood, trees are made of wood, and then I water it, I fertilise it, I put it in a sunny position, why doesn't it grow? Why doesn't it flourish? Why doesn't it bring forth buds? Why doesn't it bring forth flowers? Because it ha doesn't have the spark of life in in inside it at all. Not at all. That's why we understand that. It's just dead matter. It cannot produce. But evolutionists want us to believe that 13.7 billion years ago, this big bang built brought forth all the order that we see in the universe today. Friends, an explosion never brings forth order. Evolutionists tell us that this miracul miraculously engineered machine that we are all came by chance as, a ra as an act of natural selection and random processing. Friends, that's exactly the opposite to what the Bible says. The Bible tells us that we're made in the beginning by a loving, benevolent creator God. 
Another question, just as I finish now, in relation to this topic of the creation versus evolution, is core is consciousness. We all have consciousness. That is, we are aware of ourselves and we are aware of our surroundings. And we know that consciousness has to come from a corporeal conscious being. The Bible calls him God. But how does evolution explain consciousness? It just can't. It just can't. At what stage of the evolutionary process, the mechanical process, did simple cells, simple organisms develop consciousness? Where did it come, fr come from? Evolutionists can't answer that. They're not, uh, they can't tell you where consciousness comes from, that self-awareness comes from, that cognizance where it comes from, that awareness of our surroundings and ourselves. Evolutionists can't tell us. They have no answer from that. You see, when we honestly think about evolution and ask real questions, seeking bona fide answers for the questions that we ask, it does not take very long for any person of average mental ability to realise that this whole theory of evolution is just an idea. It's an absolute hoax and it doesn't line up. The hypothesis does not square up with the advances in modern science. And you don't have to be a PhD to understand this. Any person can understand this material. Even a child can understand this material. And you can illustrate it this way. If you were to go along the beach and you see a sand, sand castle there, and it may have been made, it may have been created a few hours prior to you being there, but not for one minute as you walk along that beach do you think to yourself, wow, look at the wind created, or look at the tide actually brought in, or look at the seagulls dropped here. You don't think that at all, do you? You know that no matter what type of um, sandcastle that may be, no matter how simple or how complex it is, it's been designed by someone with a brain, with intelligence. And the same applies in this world that we live in today. The idea that all the design and all the order that came into this world has just happened by chance is an absolute impossibility. The only real conclusion that we can deduce from what we experience and what modern science is telling us today in the physical and modern world is that the universe has laws put in place by a loving and benevolent God, the God of the Bible. And within even the DNA, it is, if you like, there are signatures within the DNA that testify to the, uh, the existence of a loving and intelligent designer God. And it all began in Genesis chapter 1 where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus preached and taught about, this, about the creation account over and over again in many areas in the New Testament. Here's just one example here. Jesus says, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. You see, Jesus believed in the creation story. All the New Testament Bible writers believed in the creation story. And the reality is that the truth is simply amazing and amazingly simple because the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. You don't have to doubt the Bible. You don't have to doubt the first chapter of Genesis. And if you don't have to doubt the first chapter of Genesis, you can have full confidence in the rest of the Bible because we are made in the image of God. And without doubt the scientific evidence today proves what I've mentioned uh, leading up to this point today it verifies the authenticity of the Bible itself wow we've covered a lot of ground we've looked at a lot of facts hard cold facts and I hope you can see that the evidence clearly shows that there must be a designer behind the design you don't build a house you don't build a house by throwing heaps and heaps of rubble and then just hoping a, a house will appear. You have a designer, you have an architect, and then you have people building it. Same applies with the world, same applies with the universe. Put up your hand if you understand now that evolution is not a viable theory to hang on to. God bless you. I can't see beyond the lights, but I'm assuming that the hands are up there as well. God bless you. Can you see, because of the evidence of creation, 
Or I'll start again. Can you see because of the way that we are miraculously engineered that we could not happen by chance? That we had to be made by an intelligent being and the Bible calls him God. Put up your hand if you agree with that statement. Okay. God bless you, everyone. God bless you. Now, um, remember when you go out today, you're going to get your Bible study guide and the additional material. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at something. It's called the good news of God's judgment. Now, there are a lot of Christians in the world today who are fearful about the judgment. One, because they have a misunderstanding of who God is. And two, because they don't know what the Bible actually says on the subject. But I want to assure you, there's good news when it comes to the judgment. Now, for people who are watching this on YouTube, at home, through live streaming and the like, you can get all of the information by going to the address that's on the screen, theorchardmelbourne.org.au. Go to the Contact Us tab, give us, send us all your details, and we will send out all the materials, no matter where you live in the world, free of charge. And that's our gift to you for being uh, a good and... Um, uh, attentive audience. Well, I want to thank you everyone for being here tonight. Why don't we close as our uh, habit is in prayer. Remember to f uh, fill in your, your cards there if you have any questions and uh, Joel and, and I will deal with them prior to the commencement of our presentation next week. All right, why don't we bow our heads for prayer now. Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you've blessed us in such a wonderful way. We see the evidence of your creative act. We see the way that you've blessed each man and woman with uh, incredible abilities. And we are a wonderfully engineered machine, Father. And I want to thank you that you have made us. We want to thank you for the evidence, even in the scientific world, that there is a God who loves us, who cares for us. And we can have full confidence in Genesis chapter 1. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Father. Amen. All right, everyone, safe traveling, and I'll see you all next week. Thank you.